Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this case study in the renal system. Let us first look at the case history. This 53-year-old man presented with complaints of passing blood in the urine for 17 days and it was not associated with pain, passage of clots or stones, fever or any other complaints. The first episode was in 1982 and lasted for 4 days. The second episode again lasted for four days in 1985 and this was associated with pain during passage of clots but it was relieved soon thereafter. The patient was managed conservatively on analgesics and plenty of oral fluids and the hematuria subsided. He then had a third episode of hematuria in 1986 which lasted for six days. At this point there was no history of burning micturation, dysuria, passage of stones, precipitancy, urgency, or increased frequency. There was never any history of fever, facial or pedal edema. The patient was not a known diabetic or hypertensive, and the family and personal histories were normal. On examination, there was no pallor, ictris, lymphadenopathy, facial or pedal edema. His pulse rate was 88 per minute, blood pressure was in normal range, and was 130 by 60 millimeters of mercury. The rest of systemic examination was also within normal limits. Abdominal examination, however, revealed a non-tender, firm ballotable mass in the right lumbar region. Its upper margin could not be palpated, while the lower margin was well defined. The liver and spleen were not palpable, and there was no varicose. This patient was further investigated, let us look at the investigations. He was anemic with a hemoglobin of 10. His total leukocyte count was in the normal range with a predominance of neutrophils. His urea and creatinine were also normal. His serum protein, serum sodium and potassium, AG ratio, alkaline phosphatase and serum bilirubin were also in the normal range. Urine microscopy, however, revealed 15 to 20 RBCs per high power field, and you can see the RBCs now. As you can see, the red blood cells are still hemoglobinized. They are pink to red in color, and they have smooth margins. So this is non-glomerular hematuria. What do we expect in glomerular hematuria? We see dysmorphic RBCs. Dysmorphic RBCs are usually non-hemoglobinized, they have lost their hemoglobin and they tend to show irregularity of the membrane. Other than the RBCs, the culture was negative. Ultrasound, IVP, CT scan and transfemoral angiography was also performed. This is the longitudinal ultrasound scan of the right kidney and it is a hypo darker rounded solid mass in the cortex of the mid part of the kidney ultrasound is usually the first modality to detect renal cell carcinoma This is what a gross specimen of renal cell carcinoma looks like. Look at the cut surface. Look at how the different areas look different. In some areas we see a lot of hemorrhage and in some areas we see necrosis and other areas appear yellow. This is called the variegated appearance 
and this is very classical for a renal cell carcinoma. On microscopic examination, this is what we classically see in the most common variant of renal cell carcinoma. Look at how clear the cells are looking. Architecturally, they appear in trabeculae or cords, which are separated by these fine fibrovascular septae. When we go to high power, we can see centrally placed nuclei with prominent nucleoli and abundant clear cytoplasm. This is the clear cell variant of renal cell carcinoma. Clear cell RCC is the most common variant of renal cell carcinoma and is graded according to the Fermat's nuclear grading into grade 1 to 4. What are the other variants of RCC that you should know of? The three other important variants include papillary RCC, chromophobe RCC and collecting duct carcinoma. Papillary RCC is the second most common type of renal cell carcinoma. It is again usually found in the cortex and it is derived from the distal tubular cells in comparison to the clear cell RCC which has the proximal tubular cell as the cell of origin. On gross, they appear quite similar. It also appears variegated, tan white. However, it tends to be multifocal in around 45% of cases. Chromophobe RCC and collecting dead carcinomas are rarer varieties of renal cell carcinoma. Here we have a picture of a papillary RCC. Look at the papillae which are lined by cuboidal to columnar cells and the interstitial foam cells within the cores of the papillae. This is the classical appearance of a papillary renal cell carcinoma. This is a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. Look at the solid sheets and the trabeculae and cells which appear clear as well as having eosinophilic cytoplasm. Classically in chromophobe RCC, we see perinuclear halos, as you can see in these pictures. So why does renal cell carcinoma develop? Researchers have found a genetic basis for clear cell renal cell carcinoma and it is related to the VHL gene. The von Hippel-Lindau gene is present on the short arm of chromosome 3 and encodes for the VHL gene product. This product is an integral part of the proteasome. The ubiquitin proteasome pathway is an important pathway which is responsible for degradation of a lot of proteins. An important protein that it degrades is the hypoxia inducible factor 1, also called HIF1. Here we can see the normal pathway for degradation of HIF once it is labeled with ubiquitin. You can see the proteasome degrading it into multiple fragments. In the situation in which the VHL gene is deleted, there is going to be absence of the VHL gene product. So let us see how that affects us. In the absence of VHL gene product, the proteasome cannot function. As a result of which HIF1 is not degraded and we can see that HIF1 accumulates. HIF1 is a pro-angiogenic factor, is responsible for increasing TGF beta, which is transforming growth factor beta, and also increases VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor, and also increases cell growth promoters like insulin growth factor 1, which ultimately result in the clear cell carcinoma. Patients with the von Hippel-Lindau syndrome tend to develop retinal hemangiomas, clear cell renal cell carcinomas, multiple renal cysts, cerebellar and spinal hemangioblastomas, and even pheochromocytomas.